Okay, so in this video, we're going to pick up right where we left off at the end of the, uh, the ninth lecture on Heidegger's origin of the work of art. So he was just starting to get into this um, uh, and it's sort of an examination of techne, this, this concept that we get from the Greeks. And, you know, the, the Greeks were using this term techne uh, to denote both art and craft, right? So, you know, people that translate the word will often translate it as art, but also craft. But there's a distinction between what Heidegger calls creating, that's what we do when, when, when we make a work of art, and just simply making. And that's what some like a craftsman might do. They both involve a sort of craftsmanship, a sort of techne, but it, he thinks it's wrong for us to think of techne as a kind of skill or action, but rather it's a type of knowing, it's a type of knowledge. And, and techne is involved, he admits. It, there is an element of knowledge, an element of techne in artistic creation, but it's different from the kind of techne that is involved in, for instance, the techne of carpentry or being a blacksmith, okay? So in the artist, he says, right, uh, the tech, the knowledge of techne is different, right? So he says, and here I've got, you know, Stanley Kubrick, the famous film director, standing next to his camera, right? A very technical film device that he, you know, he was, he was a master of, the, you know, as, as most critics think, you know, you might not agree, but, right, this is sort of the, 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 uh, the, you know, the kind of uh, conventional knowledge. So obviously Kubrick had, uh, Stanley Kubrick had a sort of craftsmanship. He had a sort of, of technical know-how and skill, but how is that different from, you know, a wedding photographer, for instance, right, who is just making a, a you know, a document, documenting a wedding, okay? So for, for Heidegger, he says the artist is a technetes, right? He has knowledge of techne, not because he's also a craftsman. So, so Stanley Kubrick you know, has this knowledge of technical, he, he has this sort of, he, he is a technetes, right? He's, he's a craftsman in a certain sense, um, but not because he's able to make a pot or because he's able to film a wedding, right? But because both the setting forth of works and the setting forth of equipment occur in a bringing forth and presenting that causes beings in the first place to come forward and be present in assuming an appearance, okay? So again, the artist is, he's a, he has this technical skill, not because he's just a craftsman, but also because the setting forth of works and the setting forth of equipment, they both occur as a bringing forth, as a creation, right? Which involves craftsmanship. And presents causes the cause sorry and, and and presenting that causes he he presents a work of art and this presentation causes beings in the first place to come forward and to be present in assuming an appearance so whether or not I'm a craftsman making a jar or making a vase or something like that that's going to be used to, to to put flowers in or I'm making a film to be enjoyed as a piece of art. There's a sort of craftsmanship involved. There's something that's being brought forth, a being that is being, that is being placed, that is, that is being brought forward and assumes an appearance, right? It's now present for me. It now appears to me. Yet all this happens in the midst of the being that grows out of its own accord, fusis. We talked about that term earlier. Fusis is the Greek term for nature. It's this coming forth, right? Heidegger argues that the early Greeks experienced being as fusis, as this sort of bringing something forth, this something growing out of its own accord, right? Objects, beings press themselves on us. They demand recognition. They shine forth, right? There's this fusis, this coming forth. So when we call art techne, this does not at all imply that the artist's action is seen in the light of craft. What looks like craft in the creation of a work is of a different sort. So the artist techne is different from, from the sort of bringing forth of the piece of equipment. This doing 
you know, that this creation of a work is determined and pervaded by the nature of creation. Not the nature of making, but creating. This sort of bringing forth. So, so again, this doing, this creative work of art is determined and pervaded by the nature of creation and indeed remains contained within that creating, creating, right? So what nature brings forth, right? What nature presses up against us, this fusis, this is what is, is, is pervading the work of art. This is what pervades the creative process itself. The artist sees something springing forth, is inspired, I guess you could say. Stanley Kubrick has his vision of the film, right? He's directing The Shining. Here he is talking to Jack Nicholson, getting him ready for the scene. He has a certain expression. He has this work of, you know, of fiction that he gets from, you know, the, the, the novel of Stephen King, The Shining. But he has a vision in his mind, right? Something sort of that, that jumps out at him. I want to portray this psychotic, you know, this killer in, the, in this moment of horror and isolation and, and, and despair, right? This, this violent uh, 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 truth of the human being right? This crazy man, if you've ever seen the film The Shining, it's, it's quite, it's quite a, a, a stirring piece, right? It's quite a, quite a creepy movie, right? Um, but Stanley, Stanley Kubrick is bringing forth, right? He's trying to sort of, you know, he's got, he's got uh, the camera to work with, he's got the material to work with, he's got the actors to work with and their emotions. He's trying to elicit a certain response. Apparently, I haven't had a chance yet to watch this movie, <clears throat> but apparently there's a documentary about the making of this film. Or actually, I think it's just about the film, The Shining, in general. It's called Room, uh, God, what is it, Room 713 or Room 7? Whatever the room number is that they stay in, in the hotel. That's the name of the movie. And it talks about um, a lot of stuff in the film. And apparently Stanley Kubrick, when he was filming this movie, he did all sorts of really messed up things to Shelley Duvall. He really screwed with her psychologically. Some say he was kind of abusive to her. And he did this because in the movie, she's, she's supposed to be scared. She's supposed to be this very scared, nervous, you know, shocked, horrified person. And so he had to sort of, you know, elicit this response from her, right? And so this working out of this vision that he has, right? Again, it's this response to the fusis, right? Um, and so his craft involves this. It's not creating an end product for use, but it's bringing this thing forth. So in the light of the definition of the work we've reached at this point, right? We've talked about this in previous lectures. What does he mean by a work? It involves this setting forth of the earth and this, this, this setting up of a world, okay? In light of that definition, according to which the happening of truth is at work in the work. So according to this definition and in light of this definition, we are able to characterize creation as opposed to just making something. We can characterize creation as follows. To create is to cause something to emerge as a thing that has been brought forth. So Stanley Kubrick causes something to emerge. The film, The Shining, emerges as a thing that has been brought forth. But this works becoming a work is a way in which truth becomes and happens. So when the film is in the theaters and we go see the movie, the truth of the fear and the, the anxiety and, 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 and the horror that Shelley Duvall you know, expresses in this artistic production of Stanley Kubrick, this, this truth becomes and happens. Truth is untruth. We talked about this in uh, the previous, not the previous video, but what was it? Uh, uh, I think lecture eight, we talked more about this. Truth is untruth. In other words, all truth involves a sort of covering up. It reveals something as it is, but at the same time, it, it necessarily covers something else up or conceals something else. So again, truth is untruth. Insofar as there belongs to it, the reservoir of the not yet uncovered, right? The concealed, which we talked about at, at much more detail in, in the previous lecture. So again, Truth is untruth insofar as there belongs to it the reservoir of the not yet uncovered, the uncovered. 
in the sense of concealment. In unconcealedness, as truth, there occurs the other un of a double restraint or refusal. Remember, concealment is not just a refusal, but a sort of uh, a, a deception sometimes. So truth occurs as such in the opposition of clearing and double concealing. So for again, for Heidegger, this is a bit of a review of the previous lecture. You know, truth can only occur within this open space that he calls the clearing. And a part of that open space always involves this, 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 this concealing, this double concealing, right? Concealing in, in the sense of a refusal and concealing in the sense of a dissembling. Truth is the primal conflict in which always in some particular way, the open, you know, and, and in this sense, he means that which is possible, right? That, that which is made possible by the clearing and by this, this interplay, this opposition, the open is one, you know, what is possible is made possible, right? So again, in this primal conflict, you know, truth is this primal conflict in which the open is one within which everything stands and from which everything withholds itself that shows itself and withdraws itself as a being, right? So this clearing makes possible everything that's possible and, and it, it denies the possibility of other things, right? It conceals the possibility of other things because it's a certain way of framing things. It's a cert certain way of lighting all that is. Whenever and however this conflict breaks out and happens, the opponents, lighting or clearing and concealing, move apart because of it. Okay, so what Heidegger's saying there is that whenever this, 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 um, this conflict breaks out and happens, right? Whenever these opponents, the lighting, the opening up of beings, the allowing of them to be as they are, and the concealing, when this is opened up, when it's revealed to be what it is, these two elements move apart because of it. Okay, so what is he saying here? Let's see if this next quote helps us out a bit. Truth happens only by establishing itself in the conflict and the sphere opened up by truth itself. Again, this is a bit of a recap of what he said before. We, we did this in the, early, the previous lecture, okay? The only way that truth is possible for Heidegger, he's arguing, is for us to deny other things for us to conceal and overlook other things. When we, for instance, when we analyze things in terms of their chemical structure, if we're a chemist, for instance, we're gonna get at the truth of its chemical structure, but we're gonna overlook its weight maybe. Or, you know, we're no, that's a bad thing. Of course, we're gonna get its weight, its atomic weight if we're a chemist, right? But we might open, we, we're gonna overlook other aspects of its being, of other ways that it can be, okay? So because truth is the opposition of clearing and concealing, there belongs to it what is here to be called establishing. So this is something a little bit new. But truth does not exist in itself beforehand, somewhere among the stars, only later to descend elsewhere among beings. This is impossible for the reason alone that it is after all only the openness of being that first affords the possibility of a somewhere and of a place filled by present beings. Clearing of openness and establishment of the open, right, of what is possible, belong together. They are the same single nature of the happening of truth. This happening is historical in many ways. Okay, so there's a lot, a lot to unpack here, right? Again, it's, it's this, this opposition of this openness of beings, right? We come to this clearing. In a sense, we establish this clearing, right? We, 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 we establish things like science, religion, philosophies that guide us, that give us a sort of space in which things are either relevant or irrelevant, either make sense and fit into this structure or they don't. Okay, so in a sort of sense, truth needs this clearing. 
but every way that we approach it, every type of clearing that we've ever inhabited as a human being is always going to be flawed and, and, and sort of incomplete. It's always going to cover something up. It's always going to, you know, at the expense of other truths, hone in on one aspect of being. And so for him, this is always a necessary element. In order for there to be truth, there has to be untruth. In order for there to be the possibility of error, there has to be this concealment, this deception. And again, concealment, not just as an impossibility of knowing, but as, as a sort of inevitable result of our seeing things in a certain light. We, sh we could see them in a different way. We could see them in a different light, but we don't because we're not, we're not shining the light in a certain way or at a certain angle, right? But this gets disrupted occasionally, right? Clearing of openness and establishment in the open belong together. They are the same single nature of the happening of truth. This happening is historical in many ways. This opening up of a clearing is something that has a history to it. And there are different engagements with beings that we can look at, we can trace back throughout the history of thought. At least Heidegger is making this claim. One essential way in which truth establishes itself in the beings it has opened up is truth setting itself into work. And so that's what he focuses on here primarily. You know, since this, this essay is an essay on the origin of the work of art, he's going to focus on truth in the work of art. And we saw how this works out in Van Gogh's painting, you know, in the painting of the shoes. We saw how this worked out in the Greek temple. We saw how this worked out in the poem of, uh, of, of Meyer, the, the, the Roman fountain. So again, one essential way in which truth establish itself, establishes itself in the beings it is opened up is truth setting itself into work. But another way in which truth occurs is the act that founds a political state, right? See, I've got this painting here, the famous painting of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. For, for, for Heidegger, you know, he could argue that this is truth happening. This is the establishment of, you know, the basic conception of modern liberal democracy, right? Representative, the, the sort of republic that is the United States, the sort of representative democracy. This is the, the, the notion of government. This is the notion of truth that guides our political life. This is a way that truth happens, a way that's established. These men came together and decided that we hold these truths to be self-evident. And when they did that, it wasn't just pointing to a fact that was sitting out there in the world and sort of acknowledging that there's a a, a correspondence between the Declaration of Independence and the fact of things that are brutally out there in the world. No, for Heidegger, this is a way in which truth happens. This is a clearing, an opening, a sort of a political environment, a space is created in which certain things are relevant and valid. You know, for instance, the Bill of Rights and liberty and things like this, and freedom and property and all sorts of these things are given relevance, and other things are cast aside, other things are ignored, right? You know, if you're a Marxist, you might, you know, jump in here with your critiques of capitalism or something like this, right? But nevertheless, for Heidegger, this is a way in which truth happens, which, you know, beings are allowed to be certain types of beings, seen as property, seen as, as, as free individuals, right? The, the reason we're able to see ourselves as free individuals that, that have dignity and rights is because of the establishment of this, this political document, right? Uh, this is one example uh, of a way in which truth occurs. Still another way in which truth comes to shine forth is the nearness of that which is not simply a being, but the being that is most of all. This is the, the approach that you might find in Plato, right? Where do we find truth happening? For Plato, it's, it's what truly is, right? The forms for Plato. 
that's a certain engagement. That's a certain opening of being. What counts as true, what counts as real, what has existence for Plato is again, um, that which is being most of all. And this carries over, you could argue, into monotheism, you know, the monotheism of Judaism and even Christianity, right? The being that is the most highest being, namely God, right? That's where all truth sort of is based off of. This itself is how truth happens. This itself is a clearing. This, this allows, this gives us certain standards for what counts as correct and incorrect. Still another way in which truth grounds itself is the essential sacrifice. This is a direct reference to Jesus Christ, right? Truth is, you know, made flesh, right? The logos made flesh. Jesus is the truth. He is the truth, the light. You know, he's the guy. He's what establishes truth. Still another way in which truth becomes is the thinker's questioning, right? This is the more secular, more scientific, philosophical, you know, I guess the post-Copernican notion of truth, right? Which uh, has thinking, the thinking of being, names being in its question worthiness, right? That, that to me sounds like a, a reference to Descartes, right? And his method of doubt his method of investigation, you know, you get to truth by sort of, you take these more complex problems and you break them down to more simple problems and you decide which questions are worthy of asking, which ones are not worthy of asking, which ones can be measured, which ones can be determined with certainty mathematically and which ones can't. For Heidegger, this is another way in which truth happens. This is another way in which beings are allowed to be. But in each of these examples, right, where truth is seen as, you know, a being that is, most of all, God or the forms, or where it's a political notion of being, right, the sort of secular, uh, uh, you know, declaration of independence, right, all of these, all of these ways that truth happens, in a certain sense, they are untrue. They involve untruth. They cover something up. They reveal beings as a certain type of being, but they overlook and they conceal other aspects of those beings. So I'm going to skip this quote here. It's an interesting quote. And I hate to skip it, but we've already covered so much stuff and we really need to move on. Um, it's, I want to cover it because people often mischaracterize, I think they mischaracterize Heidegger as anti-science. He's not, I don't think he's anti-science. And in this quote, he's seeing science as just sort of possible because of a certain clearing, a certain opening and a certain comportment with beings. It's not the end all of all, right? That's not, that's not to detract from its usefulness, but it also itself does not, um, <clears throat> it, it doesn't really um, escape this criticism. It doesn't es escape this criticism of, being a form of of of, uh, of of engagement and knowing things that 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 overlooks some aspect of being right. So again, I'm, I don't want to spend too much time on it. We kind of cover way too much more material uh, for this, but but I'll leave it in the handout for those of you who want to upload this uh, this uh, the PowerPoint presentation. So back to talking about truth in the work right, in, in the work of art. The establishing of truth in the work is the bringing forth of a being such as never was before and will never come to be again, right? So whether or not you like this Jackson Pollock paint, painting, Full Fathom Five, this is sort of like the painting that got him so much attention and sort of started his, his, his sort of infamous career. Before this, he was sort of a struggling artist. Uh, whether you like this painting or not, when he made it, there was nothing like this that had ever been done before. And and even when he started doing other drip paintings and using objects besides paint, you know, he's got objects he found in his pocket, you know, coins and stuff that he just sort of, you know, paints over and puts them in the canvas here. Um, this is something unprecedented. unprecedented. It's its own unique work. And even if he's going to use the same techniques, they'll be on a new work, a new object. So again, he's bringing something forth, a being that's never been brought forth before. You might also say that's different from equipment. You can make 20 or 30 hammers, and even though they're all unique and they're their own hammer, 
they're not really unique in the sense that they are a hammer. They're not unique in the sense that they're a piece of equipment. But the work is, the work is its own thing. It's its own unique piece. Jackson Pollock's Full Fathom 5 is the only Full Fathom 5 there ever is, ever was, or ever will be. So the bringing forth places this, this unique being in the open, right? In, in, in the open, in, in the realm of possibility. You know, he throws it into the world, this clearing that makes all things open and possible. He brings forth and he places it in the open in such a way that what is to be brought forth first clears the openness of the open into which it comes forth. Again, a very obscure line, a very obscure passage. What the heck is Heidegger talking about here? Well, again, when, when Pollock makes this painting, he's doing something completely unprecedented. And so it opens the open, it opens the realm of possibility in such a way that to, to be brought forth that it first clears the openness of the open. So it, it actually, it allows there to be more possibilities. When I see this painting, I'd say, geez, <laughs> I never thought of doing that. That looks kind of crazy, but it looks kind of cool. I thought paintings were supposed to be pretty. And I thought they were supposed to be representational. But this is just a bunch of clutter. But man, it, for some reason, it's kind of cool. I think I want to do this as well. Okay, so again, it opens up, right? It clears the openness of the open into which it comes forth. Where this bringing forth expressly brings the openness of beings or truth, that which is brought forth is a work right so that's the work part of it that's what makes it a work is this ability to sort of open up the realm of possibility to sort of spread the possibilities to change the nature to shift the lighting of this thing that that, that Heider's calling the clearing right creation is such a bringing forth as such a bringing it is rather a receiving and an, and an incorporating of a relation to unconcealedness, okay? So in a certain sense, this is the relation between art and truth and work, the work and truth. If we think of truth as unconcealedness, as a sort of, you know, letting things open and, and, and sort of shining a light on them and focusing on this, right? <clears throat> this is how the, the work of art relates to truth. It does this. It sort of it unconceals things. It reveals things. In this case, in the Pollock painting, it opens up the possibility for other forms of art, right? So this is a long passage here. Let's see how I'm doing for time. I'm at the, like, almost the 30-minute mark. So instead of jumping into this long, long passage, let's go ahead and stop the video here. I'm going to pick up the, the, uh, the video right here where we left off with this long quote and really you know we're kind of starting to finally winnow away to the end of the lecture and get to a nice concluding uh, 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 picture here but i'm going to save this for later man i've just done four videos in a row i am pooped and i just had a meeting with my students that went pretty well uh, it was pretty fruitful but man i need to get some lunch my stomach is grumbling uh enough complaints uh, i'm glad you stuck around for the end of this video um later this evening um or early tomorrow morning, one or the other, I'm gonna wrap all this up. I've got at least at least two more videos to go for Heidegger, if not three. And then we'll be done with all this stuff. And maybe I, I might even do a video where I try to kind of wrap everything up together, this whole course, philosophy and the arts. I might just do that in the last Heidegger video. I haven't really, we'll kind of we'll kind of cross that bridge when we come to it. But as always, like I said, thanks for sticking around to the end of this video. Uh, look forward to uh, you know your comments, your questions, and 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 your your continued interest in philosophy and philosophy of art. Um, and I hope to see you on the other side. Cheers.